So I am opening up the <coughs> webinar today. Um, welcome all. So lovely to see you here. Um, this is a webinar on the topic uh, how adult education can save your life. Um, I am Ricardo Mochilnik. I am the policy and advocacy officer of the International Council for Adult Education and I will be guiding us to through this next hour here or through this webinar. So um, we have people participating from all over the world, from various time zones. So actually that's also the reason why we are recording this meeting. I hope that's okay for you, um, because we would like to yeah, share the video also afterwards um, in case some other people are not um, around and are not able to join live today. Thanks so much for your understanding. And as I already mentioned, there is a um, chat box on the right side um, of the screen. So please let us know where you're from, where you work, um, um, which time zone. So um, this webinar is organized by ICAE, the International Council for Adult Education and CVV International. Um, ICAE, I will... Um, share um, the link to our website here is a network advocating for youth and adult education on a global level we are actually all over the world all over the world with 75 countries up more on the website which I uh, just posted in the in the uh, chat box um, just a very um, short introduction about this webinar from my side and then afterwards um, I will as quickly as possible hand over to Henrik and Leona, our uh, main speakers today. So this webinar actually takes place in the framework of the virtual seminar which is organized yearly and um, this virtual running, uh, this virtual seminar is still running until the end of March. Currently, or this year, we have the topic of the role, the role and impact of adult education. So uh, many of you who are here today have already joined the seminar. And it has been a very interesting discussion and very inspiring conversations. So um, you can read up um, um, the uh, articles and the comments which were done so far um, on the website, um, which are just, oh, sorry. I post to everybody, um, which I just posted uh, in the chat box. So um, you can still join the virtual seminar. Um, you just have to register. Um, and I will be sharing a lot of things here through this link. So, and this virtual seminar is based on the journal from the International about adult education and development. And yes, and one of the articles. Uh, was by Henrik Lopez, and we will discussing will be discussing his um, this, uh, his article and his contribution today, together with our very kind commentator uh, Leona English, and she's based in Africa, uh, in Canada. I'm sorry. All the time here. So, um, who is Henrik? Who is here? Henrik is a professor and researcher of public health at the Portuguese Catholic University. He cooperates very closely with UNESCO as an expert for literacy and health promotion. He has also been a consultant to parliaments and governments of several European and South American countries concerning public health. He's also appointed for the, by the Portuguese Republic to the sub, sub, Supreme Court of Justice. And he uh, used to be the president of the Scientific Council of Faculty of his faculty for six years and the director of a Center for Scientific Research in Lisbon over eight years. And of course, he has published a lot of books, a lot of chapters of different books, and several public publications in scientific journals. And one of the journals he published in was this uh, DVV International Journal on Adult Education and Development. So he wrote about how adult education actually can save our life, your life. So um, I'm looking forward to your presentation, um, Henrik. And yeah, hand over to you now. Hello, everybody. Um, in the first 
in the first place, I want to make a, a statement uh, for those, I suppose the majority of, of you are uh, specialists on education. I'm not. So sorry for some scientific error that I can commit in terms of education. What I'm going to present, it was the, and what is the article, it was the uh, a light version, the article is a light version of the, what I presented at the uh, Confitia Midterm Review uh, in November 17. And um, what uh, I'm going to share, the, this, um, this presentation, uh, in order that you can see too. I hope that you see. It's okay? Can you see? Okay. Yes. So, so what, what is the point? The, the, the main point is typically people uh, want to have the most advanced technology um, when people become sick or um, even when they are health, they, they, it's very good to, to, to tell that my hospital is a very high tech hospital and I can treat everything. But this, this, is, a, a, this is a wrong view. Uh, uh, people must understand that uh, the, the 80, 85% of the, our health came from uh, our lifestyle, our conceptual risk behavior and uh, uh, with our relation and responsibility with our health and the, the, the health of those that are under our guard. So, what I defend from 24 years now is that uh, we should, we must, to, to, to invest in prevention much more than in uh, treatments. Uh, meanwhile, my very good friend, a great specialist on education, uh, Portuguese person named Roberto Carneiro, maybe, maybe some, uh, some of you know it, uh, he invited me for an intellectual challenge uh, in the past uh, for, for analyzing the, uh, an educational big program for uh, adults in Portugal. It, it was named uh, in Initiative New Opportunities. And it was the, uh, a start for thinking a little bit uh, between the bridge that we need to establish between education and healthcare. So the, the usual paradigm uh, in health is always every year to put, to put more money in the budgets of health ministries and the secretaries and hospitals and everywhere. And you put more professionals, more money, more pills, more surgery rooms, etc. And my point is why? What for? Why we, we need to expend trillions of dollars in treatments, very expensive treatments. For example, the, the most recent treatments for cancer uh, are arriving in the this is 18 and uh, maybe in the next five years between $100,000 and $500,000 per patient per treatment. <clears throat> is this affordable? No, it's not possible to afford this. So we need to think again the healthcare paradigm and to understand not the, 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 the end points, but to understand the roots. For example, diabetes is the most expensive disease in the Western world. And we can avoid 90% of the situations. How to change lifestyles? We can avoid at least enough of circulatory disease, diseases till 60 year olds. We can avoid with a proper food at least 50% of the digestive cancers. But for that, we need to improve knowledge in people. Sometimes very simple things. But we need to have knowledge, educational knowledge, in two steps. First, literacy and numeracy, classical ones, because around 35% of uh, acute situation in the hospitals became from wrong understand of how people should take the pills. 
double uh, intake avoidings, uh, confusions, etc. It's around one in each three uh, acute situations. And later on, when, when, when a person become sick, how to know to be a patient, how to know to be a caregiver. By other hand, another big root of uh, problematic situations in health is risk behavior. Addictions, for example. And in Portugal, we have a very good experience in uh, uh, addictions combat. We can reduce 96% the, the deaths related with addictions. We reduced around an half of the crime related with addictions. And uh, this is not made with pills. It, it was made with laws, with training, with communication, in all sense, information over the people. All countries in the world has a huge problem with car traffic uh, deaths and patients. All countries in the world have lots of other, other kinds of accidents. So if you can reduce just a little bit of risk behavior and lives and improve a little bit of lifestyles, we can have uh, achieve huge impact in profile of morbidity and mortality in one nation. So we need to take political choices. More than pills, we need political choices. We need to cut the actual situation that means uh, a disease become an economical rent for many companies. I do not speak only pharmaceutical companies, but hospital companies, uh, diagnostic companies, etc. Transform it was transformed in a, a, a very profitable situation to have millions and million persons uh, diseases with some uh, situation. So, if you, in place of put more money, more effort, more professionals in the in the bucket, if if we, we close the holes of this bucket, educating people, changing lifestyles, reducing risk behavior, maybe I I, I can tell for sure we go to improve the general situation. And reinforce this reading, we have the history. In the last 150 years, most of the improvements, it was very simple, very easy things. For example, to, to, to wash the hands in the hospitals. It was a big fight between 1918 and 1952 for professionals of health washing the, the hands after treating a, a patient. To put more money in prevention, nowadays, especially in the Western countries, 98% of all money expended in health and healthcare is expended in treatments, and just 2% in, in prevention. And most, large, most of this 2% is vaccination. Everything more is almost a non-existence. So we need to reinvent the importance of soap because soap, good water and good food change the world. Not necessarily complex situation. And for this, for achieving two, 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 two big goals. How to know to be a patient. Most, I, I can, in, based in my professional experience, I maybe I'm not unfair if I tell him 89% of people do not know how to be a patient. Because for, for being a good patient, people must be involved. And involved is not only to know what the, na the name of the pills, of the hours of the pills, but to, to be a member is, is to be a partnership with the physician, with the, with the nurse, with the somebody that works with us in health. It's a partnership. And for be a partnership, I need to know how to take decision making, for example. And it's known that when physician and patient take the decision in a common agreement, the improvement is much quicker, it's much more stronger. 
to express some easy ideas how to change lifestyles. For example, everybody wants to fight against cancer. Okay, you can, it, it's good to fight against cancer naturally, but with very few measures, for example, if you know how to use the sun, but do not expose too much to the sun, you can avoid 80% of skin cancers. If you take a soup twice a day, easy soup, you can avoid around, depends on the, the, the zone, but around in, in average, enough of the, the digestive cancers. And these small things is very important. For example, how to take care of a baby, how to choose my food in the market, how can I manage the hours of my pills. So, adult learning education for me and for many other persons uh, is one of the key, one of the keys that can change because adult education is very plastic. And in each phase of life, people need different things, different knowledge. I cannot tell to, to in, in the school to a kid how to manage a person in uh, older ages, in 60, 70, 80 years old, because they don't want and when arrive that time, for sure, will be different. But if I can, training now, people with 20s, how to be a good mother or good father. If I can treat a, a woman in 40, 50s, how to make a good menopause. If I can explain properly how to be aging in an active way, I can transmit the key of many, many problems. Here, there are you, a traditional uh, um, a discussion. Okay, is my morbidity profile the result of my social class or educational class or what, what, as you want or is the result of my actions both clearly both clearly both natural poor people has more problems they have be problems before rich persons and less healthier but there are different issues for example very poor persons have much more infectious diseases rich persons have much more endocrinal diseases circulatory diseases cancer diseases so natural there are a, a, a social impact on that but this social impact has different reflections, not necessarily the, 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 not solving the point, so, but change the problem. It's not no problem, but different problems. So adult learning education in every situation could help a lot uh, the, the health profile of any country, of any region. And this is very integrated in, in the other, at the other, uh, 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 sustainable uh, goals, uh, development goals. Um, I put here the the the, the connection, the, the the connection between the goals declared uh, for for health, and you can see in the most of them, uh, the minimum is the the the, the, the round, the, the maximum is three stars, and uh, as you can see, there are strong relations uh, between them. And passing to some, uh, this is just our uh, expertise in, our, in, our, in, my, in my unit of public health. Uh, I can uh, arrange thousands of other good examples. Uh, it's just what I manage and what I know better. Uh, I, I presented two, three very, think, very easier examples. The first one is, uh, is it was passed at Guinea-Bissau. <laughs> Guinea-Bissau is one of the poorest countries in the world, in Africa. And in, inside Guinea-Bissau, there are a, a, an archipel uh, named Bijago. Bijago is the, the poorest zone of the, one of the poorest countries. That's, you can imagine everything is uh, special. We can see here two images, one of the traditional school from Bijago, 
primary, primary school, and uh, the other is uh, one reception that they made uh, from uh, one team that arrived. During this action, it was made locally by an NGO. Um, we are just advisor, scientific advisor, and we receive data. We don't have uh, never uh, local action in, on the field. But the, the, the point is, um, there are some, uh, some wrong perceptions one, one not in, in health. One wrong perception is uh, African people have uh, very good teeth. It, it's absolutely fake. They have the same problems as uh, Western people. And um, in Africa, it's very usual to, 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 to see very problematic mouth. So it was implemented. Uh, a program in, in, the, in the islands, uh, together with the primary professors, uh, achieving the, the kids and through the kids, achieving the families. And the program is very easy that, I, as I told, uh, they, all of them, the 20,000, was so, uh, viewed by the, the dentistry. And um, we teach how to brush the teeth. And this is important to do. In three years, it was possible with this very small training, passing from a very complex situation in mouth to a uh, European similar level. Natural, there are new problems. For example, there are only one toothbrush per family for eight, nine, ten persons. They, they receive very bad quality dentifrics. But it was a, a, a very, very uh, good result in this month. Another, another uh, program that is a uh, three years program till now, and we want to, to achieve at least till 2025, is a, a tool for hepatitis C. It's a blood-borne virus. 71 million persons in, uh, in the world uh, are sick from uh, hepatitis C. It's, um, it's a disease from uh, group risks, uh, very connected with the drug use, prisons, uh, um, uh, use of medical tools, without hygienic conditions, uh, blood transfus transfusions without uh, strong measures of prevention, etc. So it's basically a problem of group risk in Western countries and um, more massive uh, risk in uh, countries as Egypt is one of the worst countries in the, in the world in hepatitis C, etc. We produced in our unit uh, the, the national consensus for hepatitis C for Portugal. And on that time, uh, we, 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 myself and uh, another colleague, uh, Ricardo Bacitolet, that is the, 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 the we manage the, the, the unit of public health. We understand cl clearly that we need to fulfill a bridge between academics and politicians. And by the contrary of uh, producing the best technological tool possible, what we, we do, it was to invite everybody for the discussion. Patients, patient association naturally, patient associations, politicians, physicians, uh, pharmaceuticals, etc., etc., etc. We put around 30 persons in the room during around one year in uh, different sessions. And we produced the national consensus that achieved very well, it was very well received, uh, not only in Portugal, it was one of the first countries for global treatment, treatment without restriction for prisoners, for uh, people who inject drugs, etc., etc. But we always remain with one strong idea that every citizen must be a decision maker in health. So we are now developing a tool that we can uh, make a download for your smartphone. Not, not today because it's changing uh, the, 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 the provider, 
but you can achieve by computer. Uh, the app for special for iPhone is not good in this week, but uh, you can uh, you can uh, make the download in your computers because it's free. Everything is free, open source. You can you can uh, use this this uh, this tool. You can test. Uh, how your your country works. There are five countries now. We will go to achieve 20 countries in the future. Uh, how works our country? How can I change my country? How can I be a citizen on health? How can I discuss properly with my minister, with my deputy, mem uh, deputy member, uh, my decision maker, political decision maker in my country? So, Another way to involve and to training people and to give uh, literacy on health is to engage people in uh, patients' advocacy and disease advocacy. The third is more, much more closer than uh, uh, to education. It, that came from the, that experience promoted by Robert Carneiro. And it was made in 2011, 2008, 2011 in Portugal. I was just responsible by the quantitative methods because there are, there are a, a larger team uh, directed by Robert Carneiro. Uh, I was just uh, responsible by the um, quantitative methods. And uh, when th lots of things, it, it was uh, found. And some of them, it was published by UNESCO in a book that was dedicated to, the, to this uh, research. And uh, you, you can achieve the, the book by UNESCO. Uh, and many, many material is not yet published. But there are very things that we have in strong insights already, but it was uh, clear. For example, when per a person, adult person, returned to school, we found very, very strong uh, uh, evidences that this has the best results in mental health, for example, especially in women, uh, among women. For example, um, change in the extroversion, one of the key things for, being, uh, for having a, a good mental health. Uh, I, I, I can be a better mother, I can be a better father, I can be a better citizen. Uh, I have much more, much more uh, self-safety, and this is not punctual, but is very general and stronger if a person has a, a lowest rate. In other words, the the ladies that uh, in the beginning has the lowest educational rate was those that improve more. But this is true among the three levels of schools, primary, secondary, and tertiary level of returning to school. So I, I defend strongly to the return of people, even to not speak nothing about health. It's good for the health return to the school. Why? Because we can improve mental health. And when we have men, good, better mental health, we have a better immunitary system. And when we have a, a good immunitary system, we have much more defense against all diseases. For example, when we can, uh, I, I made my PhD in an oncological hospital, and I always remember that when we had a patient uh, with a good mood, if I can use this uh, phrase in the oncology, uh, but it, it, when we have a patient with a good mood, in the average, we have a survival rate better in around 20, 25, 30%. So if we can, by returning to school in adult ages, improve mental health, for sure, we go to have better patients and less patients. This, is, this slide is more related with the conference. I, I do not annoy you uh, discussing that, but in conclusion, health, adult learning education is really important. As I spoke, indirectly, when we are making people return to the school and we validated this person socially, 
as well when you use that time or the, that knowledge for improve uh, uh, health knowledge and health prevention. Adult learning education is much more adapted to health because it's very personalized. And being personalized can answer to a personalized questions and nothing more personalized than health. First, because it's very few expensive. Uh, one week ago, when I spoke with Leone and, and Ricardo, I give an example, a very concrete example, that the most expensive machine in healthcare nowadays is a proton accelerator, is around $100 million each one. With $100 million, what we can do in adult learning education? For sure, much more prevention, much more years of uh, well-being than uh, using in some specific cancers. It's very easy to integrate it in, in, in respect with the uh, with, um, local culture. I, I have another example, I do not put it here, but it was a very uh, good example that I learned in, at uh, Guinea-Bissau. During around 100 years, because Guinea-Bissau it was a Portuguese colony, uh, Portuguese and uh, general institutions uh, told to the tribes that they you must have a, a, a latrine in every village, in every places. And they made latrines. The problem that they, because it's not a cultural thing, they make the latrines over the well. And nowadays, 92% of wells in Guinea-Bissau are contaminated. So, with adult learning education, we can have much more closer to local cul cultures and to respect local cultures. And this is very important too for uh, health acceptance. Special, if you want to, do, to reduce child mort mortality, you must change many things in local cultures. For example, in Africa, there are a very, very few numbers of uh, kids with uh, disabilities. And this is, this is very simple to explain. First, because they have much, much higher uh, child mortality. Second, because in some tribes, for example, Mozambique is, is one exa example, they understand that a child with a disability is something magic. So when there are bad, bad times, for example, a dry moment, they sacrifice a, a, a disability child. In the, in the north of Mozambique, this is a huge problem, but not only in the north of Mozambique, in many other places uh, in Africa. That's why we have around 10, uh, 6 to 10 persons, some kinds of disability in Europe, and in Africa is less than 1%. Henry, not because, may, yes? may I ask you to <laughs> wrap up? Uh, oh, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to be, to this. thank you, thank you for uh, your alert. <laughs> so we, we, we can, without learning education, we can change lifestyles, we can change risk perception. And for, with this, we can produce better citizens, better patients, and special better caregivers. So, but more than I speak more, because when I speak to, about this, I speak too much. Uh, <laughs> I, I answer to, to the, the questions of Leon and the, the, every other person that uh, listens. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Henrik. It is really a pleasure uh, listening to you. And I can see, or we can all see, that you're very passionate um, about uh, this topic. So thanks so much. No problem. <laughs> no, 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 that's the pleasure. <laughs> that's, the, that's the beauty. Um, so um, thanks a lot. Um, and before um, I hand over to Leona, I invite all the other participants to write your comments and questions in the chat box. I have seen quite a lot of people have already <coughs> posted their comments, so um, we will come back uh, to your questions uh, right after the input by Leona. I will collect the questions together with my colleague Dushan, who's in the background helping me um, also from a technical point of view. Thank you so much. And I have the honor now to introduce Leona English. A real pleasure to have you here today as a discussant and commentator. 
Um, Leona is a professor of adult education at St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia, Canada, not Africa. <laughs> she is very much interested in questions of gender, health, spirituality, and she's also the editor of the very well-known international encyclopedia, encyclopedia of adult education and she's co-editor of the adult education quarterly. She's the past president of the Canadian Association for the Study of Adult Education and recipient of the Cyril O'Hall Award for Understanding Research from the American Association of Adult and Community Com Continuing Education. And very well known is her book Adult Education and Health, um, which really very well introduces a theory of adult health learning and how teaching and learning really insights can be used to improve health in clinical higher education and community settings. So um, very well, very warm welcome here. Thank you so much, Leona, and I hand over to you now. Thanks so much. Mm, wait a second. I'm going to pull up my screen here. And let's find that. Yeah. Whoops. There you go. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik, and thank you, Ricarda. I'm very pleased to be here. This is a topic close to my own heart, and I'm particularly pleased to see uh, so many students in adult education joining us today, students and colleagues. Um, the response that I will give to uh, Amrik's presentation is, um, you know, it is uh, grounded in experience and in research and uh, immediate uh, reaction to some of your words there, Amrik. The first thing, I'll agree with you on several different uh, matters with regard to health and learning. And as you know, my, my base is in adult education and uh, learning, and uh, yours is public health. So we come at this from a few different perspectives. First is, I'll agree that there are undoubted links between health and learning. Um, I was privileged to present with, well, on the same stage with you at uh, Confrontea in um, review in Suwon in Korea and to be able to present the global report card on adult learning and education for UNESCO. And uh, clearly that global report from 195 member states makes it clear that health and learning are intricately connected, but it goes further. And my own understanding of adult education and learning extends some of your conversation. I would bring most of it to, to move it from the individual to a societal level and to the uh, social, cultural, economic perspectives that affect health. The second thing that I would agree on and found very good in your presentation was to focus on health literacy, teaching people to uh, take charge of their own health, to find out about their own health and their diseases and to avoid risky behaviors. And we know that that's been, you know, a focus of the OECD countries, and that has really helped us bring, uh, you know, restore or create or increase positive health outcomes in, in these countries and in others. And I, I can see in your presentation that you're interested in that one-on-one -on -one instruction that's going to, that health literacy, that's really going to improve outcomes. There's no doubt that countries with a focus on health are doing that and need to do an awful lot more. Is your focus on, on public policy. Again, that was a focus of the GRAIL-3 report. You know, asking member states, you know, that answered the, the uh, monitoring survey to uh, focus on where their public policies were going and to look at uh, how their policies might be more integrated. So that fed directly into, and certainly was a big part of your presentation, into the sustainable development goals. And you focus uh, greatly on um, goal, uh, on the goal on health goal three. And I know that you, you certainly did a good uh, job there of uh, presenting the goal and 
the numerous targets that go with the goal, targets and indicators. Well, I'd like to extend your conversation to what I would consider to be a bigger view of an adult learning and education. And that is to say that adult learning goes beyond the individual instruction that is necessary to achieve health outcomes. It extends to the community, like the sustainable development goals here. It looks at multiple factors affecting health and well-being. And uh, the goals, uh, it, the fourth goal in particular, education, comes closest, I would say, to responding to the health crises. And that's the one you've outlined very well. Direct education, improving literacy, improving health literacy, uh, focusing on increasing, you know, increasing our scores in PIAC and, uh, and uh, increasing levels of knowledge, school, school outcomes, school completion. But I'd like to extend it to what I consider to be the field of adult education, which is concerned with all of the 17 goals and how they interact uh, to achieve, you know, the lifestyles and general well-being of the population and hopefully achieving sustainability by 2030. So I know that's a big goal. So I would say that an adult education perspective, adult education and learning would probably want to think not only, it would like to put goal four, intention or conversation with all of the goals and say that we have to be working simultaneously on everything from decent work to transportation, to clean cities, clean water, working on these simultaneously and thinking of uh, the grassroots, not only in Guinea-Bissau, but in our own local communities. I'm in, I'm in a country that has, we score very well on the Human Development Index, but we have a lot of work to do on a lot of these goals. And I would say a comprehensive view of adult learning and health has to be uh, one that works on many of these goals simultaneously. I'll just move to my next slide. And I would say that an adult health learning approach, and of course, this is not only my view, but certainly the view of colleagues like Maureen Cody, and if Nicole Baden Clay is on here, and uh, and certainly uh, Claire Mills, who's on here as well, would be an approach that looks at what the social determinants of health. And Canada's been a leader in promoting the social determinants of health, which I consider to be uh, strongly grounded in a comprehensive adult education approach. Now, you've included these, but of course, you've, you've pressed on to a focus on goal four. I would say that the social determinants of health look at broader factors and see adult education as embracing many of these factors. Things we know about education, but things we know about how health is achieved. Look at the Nordic countries, and I would say they practice a social determinants of health perspective, which is focused on the more disadvantaged, the people who are outside the uh, you know, the, the higher incomes, higher social status, whatever. And uh, a social determinants of health perspective would, would uh, work with adult learning and would see adult learning as one component or one-on-one -on -one instruction as one component of a healthy society. It would also have a strong emphasis on critical perspectives, looking in particular at the marginalized, and of course, um, you know, that's a focus of all of us, but it's a particular focus of social determinants of health. Who's outside that circle? Who's not within the OECD circle? Uh, who, uh, particularly issues of gender, issues of race, issues of disability, as you point out, and uh, looking at how there are structural impediments, not just personal impediments, but structural impediments that are keeping all of us from achieving healthy outcomes. So that's a, a thought to add to your presentation. And then I've, looked at the, I've mentioned the social determinants of health, and clearly they're supported by the WHO, and they do promote an intersectional approach 
all 17 of the SDGs, as hard as it is, to achieve all of these by 2030. And my own particular um, interest being in gender, how women are dispropor disproportionately affected when it comes to education, health, uh, poverty rates, um, and how a focus on gender might be a particular way of uh, doing all of our work. And I would argue that this will give us clear results in the long run because it's intersectional. Uh, Enrique, I appreciated your presentation and uh, you won't be surprised and I'm going to ask you several questions that build on um, my po previous points. That is the link between the individual and the social in your proposal. If you could bring these, uh, if you could speak to those links and uh, to the points that I probably didn't hear in your, in your talk. How you might, secondly, unpack the, uh, the relationship between the practitioner and the policy maker, because there clearly is a great divide. In adult education in Canada, we don't have a voice in public policy, I would say. In large measure, we don't have that. And thirdly, what you would say to the least developed nations about learning and goal three. So, um, you know, you can take one or three or uh, all of these. Um, I invite you to provide a response. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leona. <laughs> Thanks for this very um, interesting and very uh, enriching comment on Henrik's article. Henrik, I would propose that um, you choose one of um, Leona's challenging questions and then um, <coughs> we move to the participants' questions and comments. Okay, uh, it, it's good because if not, I need three hours for answer to the <laughs> so deep questions. We have of three Leona. more minutes. So. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I completely agree with Leona, and uh, my presentation is just the link between adult learning, education, and public health. Yeah. And that's what, that, that I subscribe uh, all that uh, that the Leona uh, spoke. But uh, beginning in, in the first one, uh, the most important nature of a human being is to be member of a society. So for me, there are no differences between to be an individual member or to be a group of member because uh, unless we have a very deep disease, mental disease, we are always integrating more or less, but we are always integrating a society. Mm -hmm. And we reflected this society. <laughs> so there are no differences for me and uh, special because lots of the diseases that a person can be uh, 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 results of the relationship that this person has inside the specific society. I give you an example. Uh, Leona spoke about the Scandinavian countries, and I give you an, an example, a little bit in the in the same sense, but it's a little bit in the contrary. Uh, it's true that uh, Scandinavian countries is one of the most developed zones in the world. And they have lots of things that I would like to, to have in Portugal. But, um, for example, Norway nowadays fight against a new epi epidemic that came with uh, high income rates and high literacy. That is um, the, 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 the epi epidemic uh, ep of the gambling addiction, online gambling addiction. Because wow. lots of uh, young persons in uh, Norway has money enough for gambling. And this could be made standalone and without the parents' control, etc. Et and and uh, I, I, don't, I do not remember exact the number, but I, it's, I suppose it's 6.7% of all university students in Norway has some, in some uh, way uh, a gambling addiction uh, related with the internet. So, uh, yes, we are citizens of the world, and being citizen, we act uh, with the society, we transform the society, but we are transformed too by the society. And this, the, this uh, local transformation or personal transformation came in the most different ways. For example, uh, before 1915, there are almost no skin cancers 
is a very small number. People become to go to the to the beach so too much time, too much in in the wrong way, and nowadays we have problems because the time between an excessive exposure to sun till the moment of the non melanoma skin cancer is around 20 to 30 years. So now we are receiving the is the cancer that uh, uh, grows more in the world. For example, we changed the, 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 from the local uh, food to very standardized food in Western countries. And we have huge problems of cancer and other digestive problems related with bad quality of food we eat uh, in our countries. So, yes, we need to have an integrated uh, answer. And probably the, the solution is to change the society not this policy or the, the other policy, because it's a global question and an integrated question of just one issue, the world. I don't know if I answered to your question. Can I? Uh, sorry, Leona, now we can hear you now, sorry. There you go. There's no doubt that, you know, it involves all of these goals and all of these factors. I think it's a question and that the social determinants of health bring this to the fore. It's a question of where you put your energy and your attention. And I would say that that is a government policy um, agenda where the where the energy is put to multiple factors, seeing bigger, focusing on a bigger picture than we usually do in public health or sometimes in adult learning. So I think it's a question of focus. And I also think it's a, it's a larger question of government policy. It moves well beyond the individual. Thanks so much. Um, I will come to the participants' questions and comments now. Um, yes. Just starting with the comments, um, Daniel says um, that uh, the presentations were very informative and elaborate. And this really provides a yardstick to carry infantile discussions of the linkages between literacy and health in adult population. So really underlining um your discussions and we had um two comments on the farmer uh, lobby Dorla, um said that if the farmer lobby should fund adult learning and education they would dig their own grave so ale is not in their interest so he says thank you for the great perspectives and also in this connection christina um asks how can we reach that adult education for health prevention can place the system of the big and strong pharmacy lobby, which aims mainly on economic benefit. So two comments related to the cooperation with the farmer uh, lobby, pharmacy lobby. Um, does any of you want to comment on this? I'd go ahead there, Enrique. So it's very easy to try to find devils and saints in this discussion. Um, my my view is more my, my view is much more political. Uh, uh, any I don't want to speak specifically about uh, pharmaceutical companies. I what I what I can tell is any economical sector has the force that the society allowed them they have this, this grade of force. So, um, for example, in some countries, uh, I, I, I put it in a historical way, till 1956, uh, there are no pa patents on pharmaceutical industry. And the world developed. Uh, appears the first one in 1956. Uh, even today, for example, in HIV, some countries do not recognize vaccination because they have a major public health problem. And they do not recognize patents, point. So this kind of force, and especially in the US, is a very problematic issue. Uh, the prices of uh, pharmaceutical products in the uh, in US is very, very difficult now. But in other countries it was, uh, I don't know, solved, but uh, 
partially solved by other way, other way. Do not look only for pharmaceutical companies. There are much bigger economical groups, insurance groups, for example, uh, diagnostic material, uh, heavy material, hospital corporations, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, an happiness, uh, health, and healthcare, it was transforming the best business in the world nowadays. There are trillions and trillion dollars around the, the health. And naturally, if there are so many money, attracts so many investors. It's a question of uh, market. So the, 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 the point is, I, I prefer to have a positive approach. Uh, the point is, adult learning education is, a, uh, is an issue with a very small budget, internationally speaking. Why? I'm an external view, and uh, when I assist in to health conferences, I see I do not understand this as a critic because it's not a critic; <coughs> it's just a, a testimony. When I'm going to health congress, healthcare congress, people are much more tough much more demanders, much more uh, fighters, much more advocators. And people said, I need to have treatment for that and that and that. Point. No discussion. And things happen. When I'm going, a few times uh, an happiness, but when I'm going to an educational adult, educa adult learning education congress, I see the most sympathetic people in the world. Everybody is so sympathetic. My cynical view is that if you remain so sympathetic with the political power, you will remain with small budgets. In the time that you are much more fighter, much more aggressive, much more exigent with the political uh, decisions, but that when at the same time when you propose tools and discussions and languages, because with all respect, my my experience of twenty years speaking with politicians and uh, producers of uh, political uh, laws, my my experience is that at least ninety percent do not understand of the problems because they cannot be experts in everything. But when they are good persons and they are persons with good heart, and we explain clearly, not in our technical language, but in the human languages, they understand and they advocate our cause. So my recommendation here, it will be, be tough, be more fighters, be more passionate, when you you present it to the political and do not be afraid to inv invite them. Invite them for your discussions. Invite them for participating in your decision making. Involve them. Because one million euros, one million dollars budget is nothing in politics. Second, always I see discussion about adult learning education. People discuss. I would like to have $100,000 for something. This is a non-existence in politics. You must fight for 10 million, for 100 million. I, I spoke in international, international, uh, international uh, rules. But if you demand and you prove the, the right of your proposals and you involve correctly the decision makers, for sure, they make with you the same thing that they make with all other sectors. So, my best and friendly advice is do not be so friendly. Fight and fight and fight. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um... <laughs> <laughs> cynical, cynical, cynical. Very, very powerful words. Unfortunately, already almost at the end of our hour. Sorry, uh, sorry. 
Um, because actually also Beth Friedman from Canada um, totally agrees with you. He wrote in a chat book that he's obviously working on the provincial adult education strategy. And he says this is also very useful presenting policy arguments for governments to align with their agendas. So Exactly, exactly. Exactly. So um, I'm glad and I'm very happy to see that um, um, also participants are totally um, on the same line as you are. So um, before I'm closing this webinar, unfortunately, one hour is very, very short. I want to give uh, Leona um, the opportunity again um, to uh, pose a comment, question, argument. Well, um, I'd just like to really uh, commend Enrique for going to policy and to demands. And I do think that adult education is weak in that regard. And, uh, you know, in a country like Canada, we don't have a national, well, we do have a national health authority, but we have so many provinces that um, our power gets dissipated. But uh, I don't hear, and you're so right, at adult education conferences, I do not hear demands, and I do hear a lot of sympathy. So I appreciate that sage advice. And uh, that that's really a lesson for all of us. <laughs> very, very well done. That Thank point. You. <laughs> Sorry for my honesty, but it was well, what I said. No. Well, here's your opportunity. Yes, and you're right, of course. And I, I'm open if I can uh, be useful for some of our uh, friends that are uh, participating in the chat. Put questions, put, if I know, I try to answer. Uh, Share, share experiences, etc. Uh, we are open, we in my unit, we are completely open to more cooperations. Okay? Thank you so Thank much. You. So they can, uh, this is an invitation <laughs> from Henrik yeah. to be um, contacted directly. So uh, thank you so much um, yeah. to both of you. My pleasure. We, yeah, it was a real pleasure working with the two of you. Um, uh, very dynamic and very um, rich uh, conversation we had in the last hour. Um, thank you so much to all the participants as well. I um, would like to uh, invite you also to the virtual seminar, which is, all, uh, which is still running until the end of March. And also in exactly one week's time, on Thursday, we will have a second webinar, this time really based in Africa. It's on the topic of the keys to a peaceful and prosperous Africa. And I will um, copy the registration link into the chat box. So it would be lovely to see you in a week's time again. And I'm very, very thankful for having you all here and um, wish you a wonderful day. Thank you so much. And, and you, much. Ricardo. Bye -bye. Thanks, Ricardo. Bye -bye. Thanks, Henry. Bye-bye, Leona. Bye-bye.